Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Allison Clark and Eric Tonter. So there's uh, been a long-standing divide between languages that check program properties statically and uh, languages that check them dynamically. And uh, static languages have often been touted for providing early, uh, early detection of errors as, and more generally enforcing uh, reasoning disciplines like type structure. On the other hand, uh, languages that check dynamically uh, are allotted for uh, rapid prototyping and for supporting the exploration and use of flexible programming idioms. So gradual typing seeks to combine the benefits and uh, techniques of both of these in a, a uniform programming language while pro at the same time providing the programmer with uh, seamless control uh, to transition between these different uh, disciplines. Now, the last few years have seen a number of successes and uh, attempts to view static type disciplines through the lens of gradual typing. And this has led to a number of, of uh, interesting language designs, which gives a lot of confidence and uh, excitement to gradual typing uh, uh, developers. But each of these has uh, been achieved at high cost. So in many cases, developing these new gradual type systems involves renegotiating the foundations of gradual typing when the prior work doesn't provide enough guidance for developing ingenious formal tricks in order to, to prove satisfying properties of your language and providing ad hoc justifications regarding what the connection is between your resulting gradual language and the original static type language. So ultimately, the, the challenge is, can we develop uh, uh, can we develop a way to make the gradual counterparts of statically typed languages routine to develop? And we believe so, and our contribution to this project is, uh, we call it gr gr abstracting gradual typing, or AGT for short. So AGT is a foundation for gradual typing, a new foundation that's uh, built on the idea of abstract interpretation at the level of types. So the idea is that uh, AGT takes as input a pre-existing static type discipline, including the uh, proof of type safety, and a language designer chosen interpretation of gradual types in terms of the underlying static types. And what it produces is a complete gradual type language, including uh, static semantics and dynamic semantics. And uh, by construction, the resulting language satisfies a set of correctness criteria that were put forth by Seek and uh, colleagues for gradual languages about a year ago. So to introduce the ideas in this paper, uh, I'm going to first explain gradual typing. So a gradually typed programming language uh, allows the development of programs that are checked completely dynamically and programs that are checked completely statically and any mix in the middle that you could conceive of. The gradual type system, the type checker, uses what visible static information is available to reject uh, ill-typed programs statically. But when the type information isn't visible, uh, it defers to the runtime system, which can also catch these errors. Now, when you look at gradual typing up close, you discover uh, a not very well-kept secret about the nature of gradual typing, which is that you can't simply look at the source of a, a gradually typed program, uh, which is really desugared into a fully statically typed but imprecisely typed programming language. In particular, the dynamic parts of the program uh, are ascribed what's called the unknown type, which uh, represents the absence of type information, and this leads to runtime type checks. Okay, I'm gonna just worry about this creaking table. So the secret sauce behind gradual typing is this notion uh, introduced by Seek and Taha called consistency. Now, consistency extends the notion of type equality to gradual types, and it's an extension in the sense that it admits all static type equalities and admits all static type inequalities, but it also admits pairs of unequal types that do not reflect any inconsistencies between the imprecise parts of their types. So armed with gradual type consistency, it's possible to take the typing rules of a static type discipline and lift it to gradual types and the notion of consistency, and this leads to a, a new gradually typed uh, type system. Now, regarding the dynamic checking, the, the gradual language uses the type system to translate to an internal language that instruments a program with dynamic checks for the parts where the static information was insufficient to uh, absolve obligations. 
So that, that is gradual typing in a nutshell, and, and the idea has, has proven fruitful, but there are some challenges to this uh, program for language design. So I just told you this idea that if you uh, have a, a, a language with type equality, you can lift it to a gradual consistency, and that gives you a type system. But as your, your typing discipline becomes more sophisticated, uh, things become not so straightforward. So if we consider a language with a conditional expression in, uh, in the context of subtyping, the result type of the conditional expression is typically the, the join, the uh, least upper bound of the subtyping type hierarchy. So this question arises, which is, what should the corresponding thing be in a gradual type system? So if you try and take a brute force approach to answering this question, uh, you'll find yourself eventually running away screaming. And uh, I speak from experience on this one. Now, on the dynamic side, I said that we uh, develop the dynamic semantics by translation from the gradual source language into a, a cast language that's instrumented. But this separation of concerns ha uh, brings up concerns of its own. In particular, the cast language is only loosely related to the source gradual language and also only loosely related to the original uh, dynamic semantics and static semantics of the underlying st static type discipline from which you're deriving it. So what results is uh, a uh, design that, where the dynamics are often driven by intuition. And while the dynamics of a fully statically typed program tend to match up exactly with the statically typed language underneath, once you start getting more dynamic, the uh, connection between the two languages becomes much more hand wavy and informal. So what we ultimately want are some general foundations for gradual typing that would allow us to systematically design new gradual type systems uh, with respect to an existing static type discipline and have a crisp connection to that underlying language which can be formally justified. And we, we feel that uh, AGT is a step in that direction. So the way that AGT works is that we go back to the original foundations of gradual typing and revisit the notion of gradual types themselves. The intuition that drives this work is that, that gradual, a gradual type system is uh, uh, juxtaposed with respect to an existing static type system. And in particular, gradual types are often imprecise, but they have some amount of static type information. So in particular, the gradual type int corresponds directly to a static type int, and there's, there's nothing left to talk about. Whereas uh, the gradual type int arrow unknown with the unknown type, we know that we're talking about a function type, and we know that the domain of the type is an integer, but we know nothing about the codomain, which means it could be anything. And then taking it even further, the unknown type itself really doesn't tell us uh, anything about the static type information. It's a purely, sta it's a purely uh, all we know is it's some static type. So we can formalize this idea as a, a function. Uh, which uh, goes from gradual types to sets of static types that the gradual type represents. And in uh, the abstract interpretation literature, this kind of function is called concretization, and it's our semantics for our gradual types. So these three equations correspond to the examples from the previous slide, but uh, I wanna focus in for a minute on the unknown type in particular. So my, my argument earlier was that the unknown type, uh, we, we deem that we know nothing about it but this in particular is a, a design decision in our language. We could choose something else. So in particular, we, we could have chosen that the unknown type might only mean any atomic type, which means that our resulting gradual language will give us information. All, we'll always know whether or not there are function types or other compound types available, but we may be missing per, uh, atomic type information. Pushing this even further, when you have a uh, type discipline which has richer information than simply simple types, for example, security types, you may choose to make some other component of your type information unknown. In this case, security types often have a level associated with types, and if we make that unknown, then the meaning could be whatever security levels are available while knowing all the simple type structure. So the result is a, a different notion of graduality where what, you were, what we would call a dynamic uh, type uh, dynamic language uh, program in this context is actually a simply typed program, and what we would call static is in fact security typed. So the idea is one person's, one person's static language is another person's dynamic language. This is not a definite thing. And ultimately, this decision, what the meaning of our uh, gradual types is, is the only design decision that you apply in the AGT process. The rest is by derivation. So given a semantics for gradual types, how do we uh, lift a static type system to a gradual type system? Well, it goes something like this. 
we begin with a, a static type system that's structured in a form that was uh, proposed in a paper that appeared here last year, where you start with a, a syntax-directed set of typing rules, and the restrictions on the types of the premises of the typing rule are explicitly factored out as side conditions, and the resulting type may be re uh, represented as a partial function in terms of the types that were provided in the premises. So we apply AGT to this, and lo and behold, we get a gradual type system. So the gradual type system is still syntax directed, and now those explicit side conditions uh, are lifted to be consistent side conditions on gradual types, and the partial, the partial functions on static types have been lifted to uh, gradual partial functions on gradual types. And this is done using the abstract interpretation framework. So to dive into this in a bit more detail, I'm going to talk about the process of lifting type predicates and lifting type functions. So AGT lifts uh, type predicates like equality and subtyping uh, to counterparts, which are called consistent equality and consistent subtyping, or often consistent equality is called consistency. And to do so, uh, I'll just explain this generally first, which is suppose I have some predicate on types then on, gradual t on, on types, and I want a predicate on gradual types. Well, I use concretization to determine the meaning of my two gradual types, and since we want a consistent notion which tries to detect inconsistencies, uh, I simply have to detect whether or not within the interpretation of these gradual types there exist any types that possibly could satisfy P, not definitely satisfy P. So this leads to our, our notion of a consistent lifting of, a, consist, of a, a static type to a static predicate to a gradual predicate, and the only part of this that's parameterized is which choice of predicate I made, uh, as well as the number of, of gradual types involved. But that's straightforward. So if we replace that predicate with equality, we uh, immediately uh, produce a relation that coincides exactly with uh, Seek and Taha's um, notion of consistency from the first paper, and if we fast forward a year. Uh, and replace it with static subtyping, uh, we end up with consistent subtyping, which appeared a year later in a paper on uh, gradual objects. Now, it's worth a moment to reflect on the uh, uh, serious ingenuity that went into the original development of uh, consistency at the beginning of the development of gradual typing. So developing uh, consistent subtyping involved first lifting the notion of static subtyping uh, intuitively to an idea of static subtyping on gradual types, followed by a notion of masking one gradual type in, uh, against another in order to understand where there could possibly be inconsistent type information. So this leads to a, uh, a sophisticated definition of what it means to mask two types which may not have the same shape against one another, and then ultimately leads to a declarative uh, characterization of properties of consistent subtyping, three, which when viewed as an image, uh, suggests that there wasn't one of these that was the definitive answer to what consistent subtyping is. But uh, in, in, in our particular framework, we were able to just kind of plug and chug by sticking static subtyping in and then uh, prove that they were equivalent. So now that I've explained lifting the, the predicates, let me talk about lifting partial functions. So in AGT, we lift partial functions in order to especially determine the uh, output types of our expressions, but sometimes they're also used in our premises. So in particular, we can lift the codomain function for dealing with function application, but we can also attack the question that I asked earlier, which is what's the proper lifting of the subtype join in order to have conditionals with subtyping? So we start in a, in a manner that's very similar to lifting predicates in that we, we need to know what the meaning of our gradual types is, and in this case, we, develop, we uh, produce all of the possible pairs of those uh, for this binary function, and then we apply the function pointwise to find out what are all the possible outputs of this process. Now, what we have now is a, an unstructured bag of static types, so there's this question, which is what is the corresponding uh, gradual type to this static type? And for this, we appeal back to abstract interpretation and develop a notion of abstraction. So the, the rough idea is that uh, gradual types have a notion of precision, which uh, some are more precise than others, and that tells you uh, uh, we, what we ultimately want is to be able to take our set of types and produce the most precise gradual type information that we can. And it turns out that uh, a notion of abstraction can have a best answer, which is completely defined by your choice of uh, semantics for your uh, gradual types. So these two, t these two uh, functions together 
uh, with their notion of optimality uh, produces what's called the Galois connection in abstract interpretation. It's kind of a, a notion of uh, soundness and optimality between the two. So armed with that, we can finally complete the diagram and abstract our bag of types to the, the best gradual type that we can get. So given this, we can straightforwardly lift the codomain function and then calculate an inductive derivation uh, by induction over the structure of our gradual types. Uh, but more interestingly is we can, we can revisit this, this problem earlier about how do we type if, and the answer is simply consistent subtype, consistent subtype join, which is defined just by calculation. And the beauty of this is there was no heavy thinking involved, so which makes it uh, quite automatic. So the, 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 the resulting static type system enjoys a number of properties that are uh, appealing, including that it is a conservative extension of the static type system on the static side, which means it accepts and rejects the same static programs. On the dynamic side, it accepts all dynamically typed programs, which means all, all checking is going to be deferred to runtime. And in the middle, we have a continuity property which says that if I can successfully type a program and I weaken its type information, it will still be typable. Now, because of a, a, a lack of time, I'm going to have to go briefly over the idea of abstracting the dynamic semantics, but it's driven by the type safety argument, specifically preservation, which we typically think of knowing that there exists some typing, and we take a step, and then there's another typing. But we can view this as actually inducing a reduction over uh, derivations. And those derivations, we can justify the steps by uh, appealing to reasoning about the type, the type relationships involved in the source and how they pass to the the uh, conclusion. Uh, in particular, uh, in a system with subtyping, we want to reason about transitivity of subtyping. But unfortunately, uh, sub transitivity doesn't hold under consistent subtyping uh, because of this uh, absence of information. So we have to uh, revisit this notion and ask not only that a consistent subtype holds, but why does it hold? And using uh, the abstract interpretation framework, we develop a notion of evidence for any, ex any uh, existing uh, consistent subtyping judgment in our program, and this evolves at runtime. So ultimately, given two related uh, consistent subtypes, uh, our goal is to show that they're transitive, and in between, we use an operator that's uh, derived from using the abstract interpretation framework that tries to combine evidence to figure out whether there is evidence for transitivity remaining, given the evidence that we have. And in the case that it's successful, we take a step in our program, and if we don't, then we're ultimately essentially refuting the static type safety argument at runtime, and this corresponds to cast failures in a typical gradual language. Details are in the paper. So th there's some in uh, useful properties of the dynamic semantics, but the, the one of the most interesting is that we have a continuity property in our dynamic semantics as well, which says that if I have a gradually typed program that types and runs to completion, if I weaken the type information, then the program will continue to run. But what this tells us is something that's possibly more interesting, which is if I have a program over here and there exists a precise completion of it, then I know that I can add type information without worrying about error bumps in the road that cause me to be diverted. So in conclusion, we wanted some general design principles for deriving gradually typed languages that are closely tied to the underlying static type discipline, and uh, we were able to achieve this for the cases that we considered. And along the way, we recovered a lot of notions that exist in the previous gradual type literature, like uh, consistency and consistent subtyping, as I said, but a few others that also appear in the literature. So you can see the paper for that. And for our future work, uh, we want to try and scale this up to more sophisticated language features and more sophisticated types. The system in here is a nice reference semantics, but it's not meant to be efficient, so we're looking for systematic techniques to de uh, derive the uh, efficient semantics, and then we'd also like to investigate the notion of blame in this semantic framework. So that's the conclusion of my talk, and I'll, uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for listening. Uh, in 1997, Patrick Cousseau had a paper on Popol that called Types as Abstract Interpretation, where he was taking a collecting semantics with explicit notion of errors and was deriving by considering different abstractions a bunch of type checking or type inference algorithms. 
And now you have shown a Galois connection from sets of types to abstract types. And the nice thing about Galois connections is that they compose. So what would we think? Can we just cut a middleman uh, and do not consider that explicit type checking algorithm, but go directly from the semantics to the notion of gradual types? Uh, interesting question. So <laughs> my answer will be disappointing, which is that I've beaten my face against that paper for a lot of years, <laughs> and I still don't understand it well enough. Um, I, uh, I think there's some an interesting questions there, but I think uh, the, the design here is partly because the, the second half of it is driven by a, like kind of a Curry-Howard argument rather than a, a semantic argument directly on the, d the global dynamic semantics. I'm not sure if those two will compose exactly. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, in your, in your uh, talk, you said that what you needed was a syntax-directed type system. Um, and I was wondering if you add polymorphism system F style where it's all, all the abstraction and applications are explicit, can you still define a notion of consistency and? Uh, and uh, so if, if I add second order polymorphism, mm -hmm. uh, we're working on that. Okay. <laughs> I don't know yet, but I'll let you know. So I'm going to step up here and praise somebody else's work. I really like Jeremy's work that you referred to that points out that as you add more type information, you can be guaranteed not to break things. I think that's a really important and often overlooked property. So for instance, the really interesting stuff that uh, Nick Swamy and others have done uh, with TypeScript breaks that property. Mm -hmm. So it's a really useful property, and proving it in a general framework is fantastic. So well done. Thank you. Um, when you were explaining the semantics, you sort of said, OK, the meaning of question mark is it has some type. And oh. that's, that's kind of the way you explained it. And right. that would suggest that, say, if I started with simply type lambda calculus, everything would have some type and would terminate. Of course, the whole point is if you go to a gradually typed system, you could also get non-terminating mm. terms, like writing the fixed point combinator. Mm -hmm. So how does that fit into your framework? Uh, so I would, I would say that I, I don't think I stated that as, as best as I could. Um, in, in a sense, you could say that what the unknown type means is there may be a type that actually uh, characterizes this specific instance, but I have uh, because the programmer can make that decision at any point, they can basically tell the, the, the type checker, uh, I'm giving you no information about the type structure of this particular expression, and it will be your job at runtime to ascertain what the type structure is. So this loosening can lead to, the, I mean, programs can fail to terminate uh, in this system, essentially because the type, the type checker never runs into uh, the, you can introduce the non-termination because of the, the imprecision in the type discipline. So does your technique include a way of given the semantics of a typed language, deriving the semantics of the gradually typed language? Or do you have to provide that separately? Uh, you, all, you just provide the uh, meaning of the gradual types, and everything else is by derivation. So it's just you, you provide gamma, and turn the crank, and everything pops out. So if I start with simply typed lambda calculus, how do I end up getting the fixed point? Ah, uh, OK. So think of this as lifting natural numbers to uh, uh, rational numbers. It's an embedding of the notion of, uh, ra of natural numbers into a bigger space uh, in a, an isomorphic way. So the, the resulting gradual language is bigger, but includes the, the original language. And you have a way of automatically deriving the bigger semantics from the smaller one? Uh, systematically. I don't have a, a piece of software, but if I throw uh, a student who's been trained enough, they can do it. <laughs> Okay, e even not done automatically, DD kind cuts are a cool idea, so yeah. fair enough, and please work on blame next. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs>